So we'll start with your, your questions and comments and then move into uh, sections 97 to 127. So uh, I know Sally already texted something and we started talking about that a little bit, although I'll return to that question of, of the noetic noematic relationship. But what else is on your minds? Okay, I'll go. I actually prepared for today's meeting. So um, I just got a bunch of questions that I started in uh, 97 and went through my notes. So a couple of questions that are um, on my mind, like um, how is it that noetic activity, that we, have, we have varying noetic activity and yet the same noema, at least the same root, root noema, and so that's one question is, how is that possible? Uh, it's almost as if the noesis already knows the noema that it's aiming for or something. So there's something interesting going on there. I think we need to get a better understanding of what the high law, the hyletic are. Um, he doesn't really spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, just a suggestion. Um, I'll skip that one. Um, Characters. Yeah, and starting in section 89, he starts talking about characters, which at first confused me, but um, since he spends most of the rest of this chapter talking about characters, I think I have a better idea of what he means by that. Um, so, um, how is it, how do we, I'm trying to read my own writing, which is difficult, believe me. Um, how do we track the name? So um, I really find, I found, let me say the sections from 97 on, I found really the most interesting part of the entire book. I know they're not as philosophically deep, but he really is um, getting into the kinds of things that, that we can, um, that we can actually think about. I mean, that it seems to me that what he's, he's getting at in these things are actually sort of a preparation for ideas too. Because um, he's talking about actual applications. I don't know. I don't know if that's the right word. Um, but he has this idea that um, again, I'm just going to skip my notes. Is that um, is that it's sort of interesting idea. I'm, I'm not sure he follows it through completely, but he has this notion that um, what we're doing is um, in various noetic processes we are um, modifying um, the kernel or the nucleus of some noema. And, um, and we do it in many different ways. And, but he has this idea that there's some sort of root, there's some sort of, um, I don't know, we might say paradigm of um, what's being modified. In other words, we keep track of these various things. It's a memory, it's, um, we're actually seeing it, or it's a fantasy, whatever. We keep track of these relative to some root notion, some root, I'm not sure what, some root noetic, no, noema, noematic, no, no, noetic um, union, um, something like that. We keep track of it relative to that. And so it's like we're modifying some root. Now that's an interesting observation. It may or may not be true. But it is important that it is true that we keep we can keep track of um, these various ideas of trees and 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 whatever um, as being memories or fantasies or being perceived and things like that. We can keep track of it. So somehow or other, we are attaching um, the I'm thinking the noetic activity to the it's somehow it's like a tagging. We're tagging the. The, the, the intentional object in our mind and the noema gets tagged in some sense relative to its how it was presented through the noetic activity um, which is um, that's insightful and worth thinking about um, and he does this with all sorts of things with being possible or being probable but in all cases we should be trying to if this is correct understand what the root um, I don't know. It's not the same as the Urglaba, I think. I'm not sure, but um, but the, it's no, it's not that. But it's but it's some root um, paradigm or something that we're doing things relative to. Um, 
Um, that's it. That's enough. I mean, it, it's interesting. And you can actually, the thing I like about this is that you can actually try examining your own um, intentional life to see if this um, is, um, makes sense. Thanks, Bill. Olga, yeah. Yeah, um, the first question that Bill asked regarding the constancy of, uh, of the object, um, I see that there is a uh, literature discussion also about it. I mean, actually, there is a uh, big argument uh, actually connected also to to Gordon's question, you know, the, the reproducibility of experience, is there the same type of experience? It's a disjunctive argument to put a bit more on it or more than that. And then there is a constancy of the object, uh, also questions. And I don't understand why the question is rising. Uh, I mean, I acknowledge its validity just simply because people are talking about it and will also ask this question. But on the other hand, uh, isn't it that the realism of the object, uh, the real object provides for the constancy? I don't understand why, why it is a problem. Um, that's the only thing I want to say. Thank you, Olga. Well, what Roga said reminds me of this. He uses this real and irreal um, notion. But I think that's, um, I, th I don't, I think that's going too far. I think really what he means is attaching some noetic activity to an intentional object in mind. So I'm, I'm not sure about that. Because I mean, the real is, you know, I'm touching my keyboard. That's real. But why is it real? Why is that real? Why if, if, I, if I just imagine my touching it, it's not real. No, they're just different noetic activities somehow or other. And we keep track of those different noetic activities. Unless it is that what he means by the real is this root thing, which everything gets modified. Oh, I remember, that was the other thing I wanted to mention. Because really, he's talking in the last parts of this chapter about the reduction, phenomenological reduction. But he doesn't seem to ever use, <laughs> say that. It's sort of weird. It's like he's saying it, but he doesn't want to say it. And so- uh, Say what, Bill? Uh, let me finish, Olga, and, I, and you can go. This won't take long. So the thing is that it's like, um, so that comes back to this notion because neutralization, which is going to spend a lot of time talking about the latter part of this chapter, is, it seems to me, should be a root activity, a base activity, because you're not adding anything. It's like you're, you're, not, you're not doing something. And so that makes me think something very weird about the natural attitude, because it makes me think the natural attitude is not a root activity. We're adding something. And yet we always think of the natural attitude as natural. Anyway. Uh, but Let's see. Uh, you, well, Peter, correct me, please, if I'm wrong, but that's how I understand it, yet, and I, I'm trying to verify it as well. Uh, there are certain referential uh, anchors, well, objects uh, in the zone, and we set it up so by means of many centuries of collective activity. And, and uh, so I don't understand exactly uh, why, when Noesis is brought into the picture, why suddenly this referential nature of real objects, why, why is it becoming, why, why is it in question? Uh, that's what I don't understand. I mean, we constituted it this way. Oh, God knows uh, how much time there is a certain notion of reality, the certain world in which we grew up. And out of that, we instituted this notion of reality and we continue operating in this world. It's a, what, what's called life world, or our life world. 
I think. So I, I, I just don't, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm not abstracting enough, but I just don't get where the question comes in. Sally, yeah. Well, I just got it in my head that the, all of this has to do with the process. And the way I got this in my head was that if noetic is the subject and the noema is the object, and then the noesis is where meaning takes place. I mean, I interpreted that noesis is a kind of a, a, a post experience or even during the experience reflection on the meaning of it to you. And that's where the sort of subjectivity comes into it. And then I got the hyalytic, that's, that's irreal, meaning, yes, you can see, uh, I don't know, a tree at night, and you know that in fact a tree is a tree, <laughs> but that the, the, the night alters your ones, if, if no, if you'd never seen a tree, you would think then that that's what a tree looks like, but you know, so the hyaletic is, it's not like um, diminishing your experience, but you, you, sub, you, you subconsciously know that it's not really real. That's how I kind of was getting it. Any other um, thoughts or questions before? Gordon, yeah. Back to 97, where he distinguishes between really inherent characteristics of mental processes and really non-inherent. So now we've got real and not real, which is a bit of a task all by itself to figure out, and he allows the noetic to be, quote, really inherent features or characteristics of mental processes. So it's a subcategory of mental process, namely those that are really inherent. And that, he says, is what noeses are, really inherent. Now, I don't know what the hell really inherent means because to the best of my knowledge, he never defined really and not really anywhere, but it's clear to him. Whereas the noematic are really, so they're just as real, but they're non-inherent. Now, I, I say, oh, okay. That means that the noetic is what we would today call the cognitive, the downstream, the work pardon me for bringing the brain into the picture, the work that, that the brain is doing going downstream in modulating the input. And the noematic is the work we do on the input. And that makes an enormous amount of sense to me. And now we have modern perception theory where we recognize that downstream work is, is a much bigger deal than naive realism ever led us to believe. We are modifying the world a lot as our information about the world comes up from the sense organ to the cortex. We're doing a lot of work on it. I'm saying, great, now I know what noesis is. It's all that work now translated into philosophical language. And we have to pay due regard to Kant and show how Husserl improved Kant in this respect, et cetera. And the noematic is that which is coming up. That is to say, it started outside the border of anything that could be called mental. And it's on its way to becoming part, it is mental. That took me a while to figure out that he really means and he says so, that the noematic are really, they're mental, okay, they're just non-inherent. That's section 97, that's what he says there. Okay, now, if I now, I can, I can work with that. That's, and, and I realize we're doing philosophy and neurophysiology and psychology are to be held out of bounds. 
too bad because I think they have a lot to offer. But they ha they're held out of bounds for the purpose of this discussion, this community of interest. We say, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're doing philosophy, and this is how you do philosophy. Okay. I'm, but, and this is what I was trying to get across earlier, Peter, right at the beginning. Okay, I can see this as, as, a, as a, an amazingly inventive theory of perception. And I mean, a brilliant theory of perception. Okay. But now he wants to take all, all these other categories later in, the, in our reading, all these other categories, which I would have thought of as uh, categories of judgment, uh, fant uh, not fantasy. Uh, oh boy, I'm blocking on the list of other categories that he has. And he says, they're all like perception. You've got a noema and you've got a noesis. And I have no idea what that noema is because all of this starts with the human judgment, with, the, with human activity. Um, okay, I'm, I'm sure I haven't been clear enough, but that's about as good a job as I can do right now. Felix, yeah. Yeah, just to say, I mean, uh, I mean, I think it's a very, really complex kind of how we to understand this, but to me, this is a theory of meaning rather, rather than a theory of perception. I mean, that, 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 that to me is the starting point, that, that perception is a, is a special case here. Um, and I mean, what, I, what strikes me, I mean, on page 243, where he talks about the noatic char characterizations are mirrored in the nomadic, right? And, and, and that this notion that the one mirrors the other is to me fairly crucial. Um, and that therefore meaning is only going to occur by this kind of mirroring between the act of consciousness on the one hand and the appearing, the, the mode of givenness of the appearing on the other. That, 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 that's how I kind of try to make sense of what's going on here. Anybody else want to thank you, all of you so far, especially uh, David and Muhammad and Asha, do you have anything you'd like to add? Or anyone else? All right, is it okay to, to for me to start um, reading? Is that all right for you? So I will say this, um, do 90, we'll do sections 97 to 127, I'll do, probably 10 sections or 12, and then we'll break a little bit and then um, to, to talk, and then we'll, we'll continue. If I was planning on breaking it at the end of 112. So if that's not, you know, if you're upset before then just, you know, flag me down and we'll, and we'll break. And then we'll Peter, do- Peter, you're muted. Hmm, I'm not muted. Can everyone hear me but Bill? You're muted, Bill, um, but I don't know. Can you, you, Bill, you still can't hear me? Well, uh, I would, I might suggest disconnecting. Uh, let me put that into chat for Bill. All right, well, I'll, I'll start and then hopefully Bill can, can um, reconnect within the next few minutes. But I wanna support Felix's claim. Uh, Felix and I, I think, agree that this is a theory of meaning and that any theory of perception that comes up arises out of that theory of meaning. Uh, because I think intentionality as a structure of noesis and noema uh, doesn't arise from perception but it is the, the structure of perception. And any noetic act like judging will have an intentional structure. Um, so anyway, I think, I think that Felix is right about that. All right, so 97. 
in this fourth chapter, Hosro lays out the problems for phenomenology to explore in the noetic noematic structures of experience. One of the first things he does is to emphasize something we have been calling attention to previously, namely, and this follows Gordon, your, your concern, that the noema is not inherent or real in consciousness. In fact, Husserl says explicitly that the noema of the blossoming apple tree on page 237 at the top quote, is no more contained inherently, Riel and Halton, than is the tree which belongs to actuality. Everyone still hear me? Yeah. The noema is imminent and within, but is not contained. It is not a prisoner or a slave of the noesis. This non-inherence is important because it marks out the beginning expression of the noema's withinness. How does the noema dwell in the experience? That is one of the key problems. As Husserl points out, the experience of the color of the noema is identical or the same insofar as it is, this is 237 at the bottom, quote, adumbrated, abshatet, by a continuous multiplicity of sensed colors. The variations of color are the correlates of the minute movements of the eyes or the regard, which is, quote, incessantly moving over the trunk and the branches, end quote, 237 bottom. Sally, this was your point about trees. Both the adumbrations, the sensed colors, which do not appear as such, and the incessant movements of the regard map onto one another so that the noema may remain free in its imminence. The hyletic, then, the adumbrations, and perhaps even the movements, are each, quote, a really inherent component, Riel's Bestandstuk, of the lived experience. And these real inherences set up and make possible the relative freedom of the experience of the whole color and of the whole noematic structure. The hyletic have their own parallel in the, quote, animating construals, beselenden aufasumen, that first incline them toward the noema and its relation to the experience as a whole. Without the ensouling, animating ensouling, beselenden, that the construals do, the act of construing, the data would not strive toward a unitary color. But this ensouling is not really my doing as an ego. Instead, these are the noetic acts that are not actional, not reflected upon. These construals, and they, along with the hyletic data, the adumbrations, together are inherent. So Bill was talking about um, the hyletic and, the, and the, the noetic. There are things that are happening in our experience, almost as prior to the experience getting going. Before we can see the tree as brown, there are... Um, color variations and regard moments of my eyes passing over the trunk and an animating presence of my subjectivity, let's say, to the data, but neither the brown, black, white alternations, we might say the pixels of the tree, neither the data nor the very basic pre-subjective animating that I bring to them those things are not experienced by me. What I experience is the trunk of the tree as brown. So what he's saying is, what is really inherent are these things that are not already divided between Noema and me. Um, so anyway, just try remember that there's there's a sense in which experience begins in acts and showings that are not themselves experienced unless we were to step outside of the experience of the tree and notice things abstract. With their interrelationship of the hyletic data and the animating construals also is, this is on page 238, quote, the appearing, erscheinen, of the color. So the appearing as such the event or the happening of the blossoming apple tree in its pink blossoms, green leaves, and brown trunk, this eventfulness, the appearing 
the act of appearing is also inherent in the experience. It's happening is not intentional. We don't we don't will the appearing of the tree into existence. Hence, all the attempts to get at the eventfulness of the event in phenomenology. So after Husserl, right, everybody, Heidegger, all these people are trying to get at the appearing of the appearing, the eventfulness of the event. Why is that? Because it's certainly part of the experience, but we can't catch ourselves doing it. So Husserl goes so far to say in this section, it is precisely the interaction between the hyletic data and the construing, the fact of the appearing as inherent, that explains how the transcendental experience of meaning as imminent can come to be at all. Quote, this is 239 in the middle, the characterization of the phenomenological reduction and of the pure sphere of lived experiences as transcendental rests precisely on the fact that we discover in this reduction an absolute sphere of stuffs and noetic forms whose determinately structured combinations possess the marvelous, wunderbare, consciousness of something fundamentally other, principel anderes, non-really inherent, transcendent. Why talk about hyletic data and animating construals if we're not conscious of them, if they are not part of our self-conscious awareness of the experience? We focus on them because they're being structured together within the appearing of appearing, in the appearing of the trunk as brown, right? That's what makes it possible for the noema to be non-really inherent, for there to be transcendent meaning within consciousness that is free, remains pointing outside of us, and yet is within us. The hyletic cannot come into view. The animating construals cannot be reflectively engaged. This is what allows the transcendent imminence of the noema. Furthermore, this is what allows the transcendental not only to appear, but to serve as the, quote, primal source, Urquella, 239 in the middle, for the experience of objects as such. And maybe, Bill, that's what you were looking for when you said Urglaba. Um, the source cannot be seen to be my doing if it is to involve me within givenness. Another way to say this, perhaps, is that the trace of givenness is in the inherence of the components that are not viewable by me, but are combining themselves already rigorously, methodically, without my consent or action. With this structure of a certain kind of, we might say, Gordon, subconsciousness, Husserl says perception is a more intimate affair. It is not, quote, an empty, presentive having of the object, 240 top. Rather, perception as my act is claimed as if relating to a beloved or a child. This is on 240 at the top. Quote, it belongs, gehört, to the essence proper of perception to have its object, and it's is in quotes for Husserl, and it's ihren Gegenstand. So it's object. Why is it's in quotes, I think, perhaps to emphasize this intimacy. Perception is not indifferent to an indifferent object. Perception has its object, and its object, to go back to Felix's point about the mirroring, has precisely its act. Now I'm going to go to section 98. Reflection then can look at the experience as such, at its parts like hyletic data and animating construals, or it can look at the experience as directed to the noema, which is imminent and not inherent. In either case, there is a parallel structure that needs to be developed through two kinds of interconnected expressions. And uh, this is one of the things that I think Felix had in mind. Quote, was 242, a parallelism between noesis and noema is indeed the case, but it is such that one must describe the formations on both sides and in their essentially mutual correspondence. What's important to note about this parallelism is that the noetic does not rule. The functional role of the animating construals 
And the constitutive role of the noases, as Husserl says in the middle of page 242, never, quote, shows, zeigt, an identity where an identity of the object is given in the noematic correlate. In other words, the noetic acts do not appear as unified, the construals and the constitutive. We do not piece together the wholeness of the tree's color or see ourselves carving out its outline or its surface. The identity is the product of the interrelationship, where, if it must be said, the noema has a greater role. Yet even the noema in its givenness as a whole does not achieve the unity of the noetic with its functional, i.e. passive, parts. So remember, phenomenology has to describe the noetic part of the experience, the noematic part of the experience, and their correspondence. It's like if you really want to get a handle on a relationship, if you're a psychologist, you have to talk to one person about the experience, you have to talk to the other person involved in the relationship about the experience, and you have to see them together and think about the relationship as a whole. You can't just go back and forth from one to the other. That's what's happening here. Rather, the whole lived experience and the whole tree as colored within it is a parallelism that is in a kind of mirroring. The noetic multiplicity of kinds of acts, perception, memory, fantasy, valuing, and of animating construals are, quote, mirrored, spiegel sich, or literally mirror themselves in the noematic ones. This is 243 in the middle where Felix was talking. A parallelism that has a kind of internal relation. What we are looking for, our orientation, allows the noema to appear in multiple ways with these or those characteristics or predicates. And something about the parallelism is what unifies not just the noetic together and not just the noematic together, but the noetic in the noematic and vice versa. The unity, therefore, of consciousness is marvelous. I don't know if you remember this commercial with a woman walking down the street eating from a jar of peanut butter and a man walking down the street eating a chocolate bar, and they bump into one another and they say, hey, you're peanut butter got in my chocolate, hey, your chocolate got in my peanut butter, and they both eat it, and then Reese's is born, right? And so they fall in love and everything. Think about that when you think about noesis and noema. It, the point is the conjunction. The point is the mirroring. And in the mirroring, something else is born, right? What's born is the noematic uh, independence from the noesis. I think, in other words, the transcendence that we make sense of, the meaning of transcendence, is born in these mirroring parallel structures of things that are intimately connected with one another as if behind our backs, previous to our noting of the tree as brown. Section 99. What we have done, Herschel says in section 99, is to prepare the way for showing, quote, the two parallel series of noetic and noematic events, or comnista, in order to arrive at the full noema and the full noesis, end quote, 243 at the bottom. Notice the emphasis on events. Everything is about striving toward the unitary unfolding that we tend to see immediately and rather obviously. There are multiple events, however, within the event of the unfolding of this experience of the tree or even this paper, etc., this means that the shifts in viewing or intention from originary perception to memorial contemplation locate different characteristics in the noema. There is a mapping that sustains the noetic movement. The noetic does not create a filter. It rather shines a light on the different ways in which the tree means what it appears as. And thus consciousness sees the object as an index of its own acts but as an index that is much more than a list of terms at the back of a book. The object, the noema, is an index that has its own life. This is 244 in the middle. Quote, characteristics found when one's regard is directed to the noematic correlate and not to the lived experience in its really inherent composition are indicated in the appearing tree as appearing. The noema reaches toward the shifts in viewing by way of what the viewing finds as mirroring its efforts. We find what we are looking for, not because we bring that to the thing. And so, Gordon, this is a little bit of a pushback to something you had said. We find what we are looking for, 
because the thing appears in that very way. The tree is beautiful, not because we look on it with beauty, but because our active valuing finds a foothold in the form of the tree, and it shows us that side of itself in the blossoming forth. This is section 100. There are, and the, Sally, this is where I think your initial question to the group is really helpful, because I think the noetic is the subjective, but the noematic has a kind of active agency here. And I think it's in this section that he's going to begin to show that. So there are, quote, intentionalities, this is 246 at the top, in the noesis and the noema. And I take that to mean that the noema is intending us that it has an active role. Now, that could be wrong, but I'm gonna continue that until somebody proves me wrong. And these are together in a certain manner, namely in their being, quote, 246 at the top, hierarchically built up on one another, or rather in a unique way, encased in one another, in ein ander schachtem. The unity of the noetic and the noematic as parallel series evince the same ge geological metaphor of encasement. They match each other level for level, and thus we have a hard time separating them. The main idea to focus on, I think, is that the noema offers to the noetic the side of itself that fulfills the noetic striving, and the noetic striving offers to the noematic the very chance to appear, to show itself. Husserl's example on the bottom of 246 of hearing a name and being reminded of a time within the Dresden gallery is instructive. Perhaps we are on a trip to Dresden and we see the newspaper we are reading, the Dresden Times, and we think of the last time we are in the gallery. We remember walking in the gallery and standing before a picture by Teniers of a picture gallery. And we see the pictures in that painting is also named, having names like little signs above the pictures. We have experiences within experiences, of experiences being conjoined in both language and straightforward perception. Encased in the name Dresden is the memory of the gallery. Encased in the memory of the gallery is the experience of the picture. Encased in the picture is the experience of being related to the other pictures that it depicts. Something in the noematic organizes the noetic. Something in the noetic organizes the noematic. You got your chocolate in my peanut butter, right? We are linked by virtue of Dresden, the word Dresden, to the gallery. We are linked by sh the virtue of shifting from reading to remembering to the painting by Teniers. The objects are encased as a response to the encasement of the noetic acts, reading, remembering, encasing. Section 101. To continue on how the noema reflects what we are looking for, Husserl says in section 101 that, quote, to every noematic level, there belongs, gehört, a characteristic, Bill's point, appropriate to that level, Stufen characteristic, as a kind of index with which each thing characterized manifests itself, sich bekundet, as belonging to its level. The noema manifests itself by means of characteristics, in which I take to be actually experienceable, um, predicable layers, right? The brownness of the tree, uh, not the, the dots of color that vary. By means of characteristics that are, as it were, its expression of that level. The appearing of the characteristic is the no index of noema in its condensation at that point as an appropriate emergence or stopping point for the particular noetic act that it calls for. The noetic act then, or the ego's regard, can go, quote, straight through, this is 248, until it arrives at the object of the ultimate level, beyond which it cannot go, but upon which instead it fixes. So the whole point is that the ego has these regards, these, these fo vocal moments or acts that it does. And how does it focus? And so, Olga, your question about like, why is the constancy of the object up for discussion? It's up for discussion because we want to witness the constancy of the object in its calling for the noetic act that precisely stops there. Um, it fixes it. 
Its wandering, the, the regard, moves to fix what it aims at. Its wandering is determined by the call from the appropriate level of the noema. It is a call. Quote, it is rather directed to the data, gegeben heightened, to the givennesses of that level upon which it fixes. This is 248. The possible regards, my noetic acts, are laid out in advance by the foundation of the noetic acts within one another, valuing within perceiving, and of noematic levels within one another, valued within perceived. Section 102. But the way in which the noema has levels needs clarification. And the first thing that Husserl does, and Bill was talking about this in the beginning, in section 102 is to talk about the, quote, noematic core or kern, kernel that exerts a kind of necessity on consciousness as needing to have a multiplicity of viewpoints or orientations or noetic acts. Quote, the situation, sak laga, is such that accordingly, always and necessarily, a noematic core, an object noema, is intended to, which must be characterized in some manner. The noema itself demands that it be characterized, that it have characteristics. And the noetic side of consciousness feels this necessity, feels its task, and begins to experience on behalf of the necessity that the core, the noematic core, places it within. So Sally, again, this is how I feel like the noematic is exerting a pull, is calling, is organizing. And the noetic has already shown its own power, its animating construal that I'm not even aware of where I'm gathering all of the, the, the um, pixels of the tree into a coherent character, right, into a coherent color. Like I have a role to play, but I don't have the only role to play. And again, this has been my maintaining this throughout the whole webinar. Experience is an overarching relationship that situates us and the object. Uh, and so I think this, this overarching mirroring, this overarching parallelism that Felix was talking about, this overarching uh, situation that Husserl has just talked about, that's, that's what experience is. And section 104. With section 103 and 104, Husserl shifts from considering the noema directly to considering the modes of belief that are part of the noetic and the noematic relationship in each lived experience. He calls this doxic modality, modality of belief. What is the way in which our belief in the object of the lived experience emerges in the act of intending and the noema itself? This is the next key question that will keep Husserl on a path towards what he calls the neutrality modification. Here in 104, Husserl talks about, quote, a primal form, er form, page 251 in the middle, of belief, which he calls certainty. That is, uh, the primal form of belief is certainty. And that's operative, for example, in straightforward perception. All other modes of belief, including possible, probable, doubtful, have, quote, a relation back to the primal form. This relation back has been a key notion in Husserl from the logical investigations onward. Sometimes you talk about relation backs and have a backwards reference. Jay Lampert wrote a great book on backwards reference in Husserl that I think is worthy of, of, of being read a lot. Um, and I think the reason that backwards references or looking back is so important is that consciousness is a kind of retroactive series of relationships. Here, all noetic acts and noematic layers that relate to belief point back to a source or a resource by which their sense is organized. What I find helpful here is the, that the way I intend the object as actually existing in my certainty as perceiving it straightforwardly is also mirrored in the way that the object appears to me. As Husserl says, this is 251 in the middle, quote, the intentionality of the noesis is mirrored, spiegelt sich, in these noematic respects. And one feels oneself forced, gedrunkt, to speak again, even of a noematic intentionality as a parallel of the noetic intentionality. So that, Sally, that's where he says that. Although he puts the words noematic intentionality and parallel in inverted commas, I believe that Husserl must be committed to this agency of the noema. The way the noema arcs 
toward the noesis is a kind of intentional being toward. The character of the thing's appearance as actually existing is not a gift from my belief to it. Rather, there is a pairing of my belief with the manner in which, as Felix said, the thing is given, or the way the thing shows itself or mirrors my belief. Belief is what I have when that belief is rooted in the given and when it is called for. What allows for some kind of a priori order to belief is that other modalities of belief are ordered around what Husserl calls the, quote, primal belief, er glaba, or protodoxa, er doxa. This organization allows for the intentional retro-relatedness, ruch bezogenheit, of all belief modalities. Objects are going to be backwards related to other objects. Belief modalities are backwards related. To, there's, there's, we don't just move forward. We move forward by engaging in retrospective things happening all the time. Implicit in each belief modality is its relation to the primal doxa. Implicit in each appearance of the noema is its relation to straightforward perception and its ability to show itself as what it is directly to my intuition. I'm going to go to section 105. This retroactive or retro-relatedness is something that Husserl goes on to emphasize in 105. There is a noematic intentionality then, insofar as the modes of the thing's appearance within certain being characteristics that map onto belief modes all relate back to one primal being characteristic. Being probable, being doubtful, being possible, all these relate back to being certain. And the thing's appearance as probable or doubtful or possible all relate back to the way it would appear as certain. These characteristics of being or existence then have a certain eidos, a certain look. And it is because of this that we are, quote, predicating them of the sense object. So Gordon, I don't think you're wrong to have picked up on the way that judgment and perception are related to one another. This is where he's saying, in fact, that they are. It is therefore the noema's mirroring its level of appearance as reflections of the noetic belief modalities that we can ever come to have a thing that appears to have its being as separable. Quote, this is 253 at the bottom. To the noematic characteristics correspond predical, predicable characteristics in the sense object as actual and not merely noematically modified predicables. For the noema itself can show layers of sense corresponding to modalities of belief, but the object is what is capable of being predicated in this way. The noema is imminent. The whole issue of existence is an experience of the separability of the object, not just its transcendence. And thus we see here that the natural attitude is secondary. Objects claim to have their own being as separable only because the noema works with the noetic modalities to promote this very possibility of appearance. So, Sal, your point about the noema and its relation to the object comes, I think, up here for, for Husserl in 104. Section 108. Before going on to talk about the neutrality modification, I would like to spend some time talking about section 108. Here we see that noematic characteristics are not created by our act of reflection. We do not bring sense to the noema. It reveals sense to us as intimately bound up with us. In sections 106 and 107, Husserl has discussed what the experiences of negation and affirmation might mean. In particular, he noted how the noema could be canceled or struck through or confirmed, and he showed how this would shift the way in which the object appeared. A confirmed Supreme Court justice, for example, looks and acts differently from one under consideration and before a vote. Even when we are conscious of ourselves as negating or affirming, the sense that the noema shows is not simply reducible to our act. The object is not simply a mirror of us. Its mirroring, rather, is more like an interconnected showing that is not the same. Quote, non-being is obviously only equivalent to and not identical with being validly negated. This is 257 at the top. Husserl uses an example looking into a stereoscope and seeing a pyramid. Stereoscopes are like those um, viewfinders or the um, those things that kids look at with the little 
I don't remember what they're called anymore. I used to have one, but um, they're old time things where you, you look through them. Um, and seeing a pyramid and seeing it as a nothing or a semblance. In that sense, he says, we are simply saying, quote, what we find present in it itself as a characteristic, precisely nullity. It is the phenomenon, he says, that has the agency. Our task is to describe, quote, this is 257, the phenomenon precisely as it presents itself rather than interpreting it away. In line with his stress on faithful description, Husserl here at the end of section 108 requires that we have courage and honesty. There is something ethical in phenomenology that seems to center in humility as being involved with experience as such, situating us within itself. 109. So I think I'm going to do 109, 111, and then we'll break for discussion. So in section 109, Husserl introduces a rather important and new kind of modification of belief, which he calls neutralization. This species of belief modality has some internal links with the epoche and the parenthesizum associated with the reduction. But the reduction is explicit, voluntary, and aimed at the essence of intentionality as such. That is, the reduction is an act of freedom that puts out of play the general thesis and of all correlates and world. It is only one way in which to modalize neutralization, as far as I understand it. Here, however, Husserl is talking about deploying neutralization within the lived experience of something, without also necessarily speaking of the reduction or even of a voluntary act. It could be a non-actional or passive way of deploying an abstention or indecision. Instead of focusing on the voluntary, Husserl now speaks of an intentionality that is neither voluntary nor involuntary. The experience is closer to that of the thing within the painting that is painted, while not focusing on the frame, the brush strokes, the dimensions of the image as such. The being referred to the thing depicted is what might not occupy us. And so instead of that, we pay attention to what is referred. In the painting of my friend, I see my friend. I do not see the painting of him. I do not see the brush strokes. I do not see the frame. I do not see the wall, right? I am neutralizing tons of stuff in order to see the frame. In such a neutralization, I let the painting as painting be undecided and thus am perceiving the painting, this is page 258, as a quote, certain having something standing there, which is not actually intended to as standing there. The positive characteristic, in this case, the, exist the existence of the painting as painting, has become powerless, kraftlos. The reason that this modification is so important is that it allows us to make sense of how intentionality, noetic acts, can be passive and allow us both to perceive and not to perceive, to allow the noematic object to function largely in the background and yet to carry on its life and agency within its referral to the sense we actually focus on. Like if there were no painting, I would have no experience of my friend, right? That's the neutrality modification is quite cool because if we couldn't focus on the painting to see the friend. What this means I think is that Husserl has discovered a way in which signification, signs or images work for us. The unity of noesis and noema within their mirroring or encasements allows us to have, quote, correlates, this is 259 at the top, that do not contain anything positive, anything actually predicable. If somebody interrupts me while I'm seeing my friend in the painting and perhaps thinking about her or him, they're like, you know, you're looking at a painting, right, Peter? Uh, yeah, that, I, I knew that. I knew that all along. Of course, I wasn't focusing on it. But if they interrupt me, I no longer have the experience of the friend in the same way. This means that not all intentional acts, not all experiences, deploy doxic modalities that refer back to the erdoxa. Or to state this another way, the erdoxa may be suspended in order to allow for connections to form between correlates that have their way to open up new worlds of meaning. So Gordon, you really energized me with your discussion of, you know, we're changing the world. Well, and at least in neutrality modification, the world is changing us, the frame and its ability to, the noema, right? The, the, the way in which it can pass down into passivity allows us 
to focus on what changes us. Uh, so one more section and then we'll break for discussion. So in section 111, one of the first tasks Husserl undertakes with respect to the neutrality modification is to distinguish it from fantasy. Fantasy, he says, is a neutralization, a neutralization of presentiation that posits. Fantasy is the neutralization, therefore, of memory, of connectedness to the world of perception by means of time consciousness. When I fantasize a centaur, you know, it's half bull, half human, I neutralize my memory of what a human and an animal are and how they are not compatible. When I fantasize something like a Dr. Frankenstein's monster, I neutralize my memory of how death and life separate themselves, how a living body is not simply a sum of parts like a car. I neither claim the logic of the perceptual world nor deny it. I dwell in the experience of the centaur or the monster without clear ways back into perception because perception itself is neither fully relevant nor fully irrelevant. But while fantasy is a neutralizing in one way, neutralizing modification as such can be, quote, set over against each positing lived experience. That's 261 in the middle. To emphasize this, Husserl goes to talk about Durer's engraving of night, death, and the devil. So, Bill, we've been waiting for him to do concrete examples for so long, and yet in these pages he has two really important ones, right? The Dresden Gallery and this Durer engraving. Um, when we see the things in the painting, we advert neither to the thing we call the engraving, the sheet of parchment in a frame or metal or whatever it is, nor to the small drawings that we call the night, et cetera. We see through them toward the object. The framed engraving, says Husserl, quote, is now an example for the neutrality modification of perception. This is still the quote. This depicturing picture object is present to us neither as existing nor as not existing. Rather, there is consciousness of it existing, but as quasi-existing, like some scion. That's 262. The dwelling within neutrality modification is thus a new mode of dwelling for both object and noesis. The noesis, for surely we see the painting or the engraving, is not voluntary and yet is not involuntary since we choose to stand before it and see within it. The noema is neither existing nor non-existing since it shows us not itself but what it refers to and thus the entire mirroring of belief modalities in the noema for the sake of the noesis is in a certain way suspended. We build experience therefore, in these cases at least, perhaps we might want to think about how far we do this, we build experience by means of virtualities. We refer for the sake of the referral. The reason that this is so momentous for Husserl is that it takes into account a huge swath of how we perceive. We perceive some things within quasi-existence in order to open up worlds of meaning that would not otherwise open up. We use things as condensed references to other things. We sense ourselves as opening on to others, onto the divine, etc. Humility, love, work, all these senses of self-abnegation or pursuit of some higher goal are implicit here in, these, in this possibility. Okay, so why don't we take a little bit and, and listen to you for, for a while. That's where I'm going to bug out, baby. Go ahead, Olga. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, you know, I, I would like to pick up on uh, something that uh, you and Felix uh, agreed upon. Um, I, and uh, so if we identify uh, phenomenology as a uh, science of meaning, uh, our subject matter is meaning, I think it's a nearly uh, metaphysical uh, statement. And uh, in that sense, it's very useful because it's uh, cutting out a uh, region of being uh, which serves a subject uh, serves as a subject of phenomenology. It then contrasts phenomenology 
with all the uh, skeptical uh, theories, which I knew who has to persistence in the minority again. It gives it a subject matter. Um, and it also changes our pictures of the world by uh, introducing this fear of phenomenological being, which becomes a subject matter of phenomenology. However, I think that uh, a different understanding is also possible, or, or it's an overlapping understanding, but still, I think it's an important difference in phenomenology. Um, if you look at phenomenology as theory of knowledge, uh, which uh, well, you know, in the field of phenomenology, uh, that stated very clearly. So, if you look at phenomenology as a theory of knowledge, and if we understand meaning as knowledge, then there is a theory of perception which is embedded uh, in phenomenology. And the same text that we are describing or discussing now can be understood uh, as a theory of perception. And I think that that's, that's, uh, uh, that's a distinction that I want to highlight. Um, and then the second, um, which is uh, point, which is um, something that I thought about while Peter was uh, lecturing uh, with regard to the uh, personal validity of the question of um, referential magnetism of, of an object on the Emma. I mean, I think that, well, I come from the academia, we thought philosophy differently. We didn't study skepticism that much, but we studied uh, Marx, Hegel, and Feuerbach. And when you come from this set of suppositions that this philosophy is uh, kind of envisaged in you, I think that the reading of Husserl is then uh, different. And then maybe, you know, the questions which are uh, so informed by, by uh, reading Oscartesian skepticism, they, they, they are not as upfront uh, with this kind of philosophical background. So, I just wanted to bring this up. Thank you. Yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah, I I, uh, I appreciated this a whole lot, Peter. Thank you. The uh, and I think it's wonderful for putting it into a form of of artistic criticism. So. Exactly, I, the painting that came to mind was Magritte, uh, that has a drawing and a caption, and the caption is, this is not a pipe. And the painting is a painting of a pipe. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it seemed to me that this notion of, of labeling uh, is what the artist uh, plays with and challenges us. So when you talked about brown being brown and not flecks of maroon and whatever it is, the artist with his palette and his brush is exactly dipping into the white and dipping into the green and dipping in and flecking. And we know that if he's a pointillist, then we get something. If he's a broad brush person, then we get something else. And then it's a question, well, is that a tree or is that not a tree? Becomes a particular kind of question but exactly what kind of question is, is thrown, it seems to me, into an interesting debate uh, with the artist and the artist's intent. Uh, and now I'm even farther out of my depth than usual, but, but it, it, it seems to me that the aesthetics, the, the, the bringing of this uh, set of concepts and way of working that you just helped us understand here, it's really very useful 
in considering aesthetics, uh, which is what Husserl is doing here in, in a way as well. Thank you, Gordon. Other thoughts? Well, I like this idea that I that um, that you were mentioning, and um, that you claim to find in Husserl, and um, I'll take your word for it. That this idea of the nomadic reaching out, this this um, this oh, this idea makes sense to me. Whether we can make um, explicit um, understanding of how that happens. Um, because the, the whole problem, the question I asked at the very beginning is this question about the noetic and noema. They're, as, as we always talk about, they're so united together, <clears throat> and yet we say they're distinct. Um, that somehow or other, how and how we have, we're just starting to talk about these various things, like, um, you know, in my notes, I was talking about snowing and how there's some, um, uh, I have some pure notion of noema of snowing but then i can attach all sorts of things to it like pure is it possibly snowing or it could be snowing or um something like that and so somehow or other it, this this um the no no noematic is always working together with the noetic um in some way um they're guiding each other or something it's like they're trying to construct something that they don't really know what it is yet. And, and they have to work together to do it, to produce it. But I like the, the, your description of neutralization at the end. And, I, and, and, that, and that did um, help me. Um, I, I'm thinking in particular, I'm sure everyone's had this experience of yelling at a TV. Now that's utter nonsense. And yet, what are we doing? We're obviously neutralizing. It's just a TV guy. You know, but we're yelling at it as if that person's in the room. Thank you. Olga, yeah, I see. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, why, uh, why are we given uh, freedom uh, in this particular way? Um, with uh, with regard to neutralization or freedom of reduction or um, did anybody think about why uh, is it that specifically the ontological positive things uh, uh, have this um, we have freedom with regard to ontological positive things uh, like why is it that we can ascribe or deny or suspend uh, the notion of reality to things in a more, more kind of a general metaphysical sense. I don't know what you mean by why. I think the better question is how. Well, either how or, or why. Yeah, but yeah, I understand. I understand your correction. I accept it. But um, the essence of question is uh, still stays the same. You know, um, it's understandable. I mean, we can we can uh, describe and uh, and uh, understand how uh, the pool of uh, of the object, the pool of noema, the pool of environment, the pool of the world incites uh, consciousness so and becomes one with consciousness. You know, we can speculate about it on many different levels, you know, scientifically and phenomenologically and metaphysically, you say it. But, uh, but how did it come about that um, we have a freedom uh, of positing? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a tremendous question. And, and that's one that keeps us lurking in the background here is this whole notion of like a transcendental ego or something that somehow or other guiding all this or whatever. I don't know. This freedom just completely mysterious. It, it is... It, it, I don't even know what to say. It's just just weird. Well, yeah, no, I can I can um, I can deny the world, or suspend the world, and die from hunger. <laughs> For some unclear reason, uh, I am free to do that, right? And people did. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so 
how I mean I, I think that 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 that's just the correlate the, the freedom that I have to suspend or to neutralize or to follow up to modify is just the correlate of the experience transcendence the sense of transcendence of the thing the thing maintains its freedom within my consciousness that's why it's consciousness of um, the of is the is the hinge as it were of the thing's freedom within my sense of its sense and so if we are mirrored all the way down then my freedom is just that which is engaged by the non-inherent withinness of the thing. Well, do you mind if I play devil's advocate in an object? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So uh, if one tries to inhibit uh, the positive, like let's say in the practice of samadhi, uh, there are According to Indian theory, there are two types of samadhi. One is uh, uh, when one completely suspends the presence of the world, uh, which is nirvikalpa. And the other one, when the world is there, cognitions arise, but they are annulled as not real at the moment of arising. And so there is an argument which goes for centuries whether the first condition, the condition of inhibiting the positing completely so that there is nothing, whether this is possible, or we are fooling ourselves. And in fact, we are not doing that, but we are, you know, fantasizing that we are doing that. But whether it is possible or not possible, that's a question. And so if it's possible to inhibit the cognition, this way or intentionality this way, then you are, I think you are right. But if it's not possible and there is a limitation in inhibiting intentionality, uh, then, then it's, uh, you know, the freedom is not built into the positing of the object in the man, I think you sense it. You know, I mean, it boils down to experimental, experiential possibilities and uh, thus it's insoluble question because experiential possibilities are um, somewhat deceptive, you know. And that's what I think. So, yeah. there, there should be other, other, other explanations, you know, not, not, not just the explanation given much, I think. Uh, can I, uh, this is really very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, no. A, a number of us in this group read uh, Michael Barber's book together, Religion and Humor as Emancipating Provinces of Meaning. And I was grateful to Felix and, and Peter emphasizing the importance of what we're doing is doing meaning. And Barber now, following Schutz, categorizes provinces of meaning. And I, that was very valuable for us. And I'm wondering if the notion of provinces of meaning is translatable some way into a discussion of different nomadic forms. Uh, so that we, and, and as Olga said, we can, there's a sense in which we can choose these forms. So when I remember Bill, for example, talking some sessions ago about Marion and the notion of saturation of meaning, saturation of meaning in the form where the icon, for example, is saturated in some sense. And that has to be a, that has to be a, 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 a statement about Noema. Uh, and, and it, but it's Marion's Noema. And that is to say, he, to, to my knowledge anyway, he was the first one to emphasize that point. And if not, then someone else was. And where, 
where is this going on? Is it going on in, in the social world of, of recorded language? Is it going on here? What, where is the locus of the province of meaning? Or is that again a, a fallacy of nominalization? Uh, where because we can label something, we think we have to take it seriously. Um, and I don't know the answer to that, but I, I, I certainly did go back to Barber and Schutz and the notion of provinces of meaning as connecting directly and maybe finding its birth in these discussions by Husserl. Anyone else like to say anything? Uh, but I think that provinces of meaning are charged by relevances, right? So the uh, Gordon provinces of meaning are seeded by relevances, and relevances are pragmatic. Uh, well, most of the time, but uh, they they are of the world and of others. Felix. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just kind of going back a little bit to uh, to Olga's point um, earlier. I mean, I mean, if I, if I understood what what you were saying, Peter, it, it was we're, we're basically almost got two freedoms here. We've got the 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 the, the freedom of the of the of the object in its appearing, and the and the freedom of of the so the nomadic freedom and the and the and the nomadic freedom. And although that's kind of an odd way of speaking, it's um, I, I I I take it to be that um, what we're, what we're, when we're trying to understand here, we're trying to understand the between space uh, between the, the the appearing and and our consciousness of it. Um, and what what strikes me, I mean, the the, the is the, this. I know we're not both kind of going over to other historical texts, but just briefly in the uh, analysis of passive synthesis where he, he he talks about the notion of allure um in and the german rights which you know is is the word that gets translated as stimulus in in psychological literature but but uh the, the core meaning of it is actually alluring something that allures me um and that i i don't control that allure you know his example of it is is walking uh above freiburg and the lights come on uh, along the rhine and uh, and that you know grabs his attention. So so, but but he he he's been grabbed, but then he grabs back, so to speak. I mean, the noetic is a is a, a mutual grabbing, a mutual kind of interaction. Um, and and that and and I mean, and that I take to be what that 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 that's the source of meaning in in Husserl's terms, and that's what differentiates meaning from simply stimulus response right stimulus response is, is simply a mechanical motion but once we're talking about meaning we're talking about something that has sense and that sense is 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 not there's an undecidability in that sense right that there's, 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 there, 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 that's what you know there's an event that has to happen to allow that sense to become concretized um but always only provisionally so um and so it, and to me, that's what's going on here. It's that process which is which is contingent, which is which, which and and which is, um, um, which which is never fully kind of complete, and and is but but neither side of it is in control, right? I mean, that the, not, 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 neither pole of this is determining the the, the final or, or the outcome. So that's dialectics of uh, of the village and the person, right? Uh, yeah, but then he talks about the absolute freedom of reduction. And I was actually trying to reconcile this this innate dialectics of uh, existence, of um, subjective existence, with with uh, with a, a claim to uh, to absoluteness uh, in the freedom of reduction. And I think that reduction, the freedom of reduction, has its limits in the dialectics of being. Yeah. It just it cannot put against it. And if we admit that, 
then we are in the realms of complete determinism, though, you know? So the, that, that annihilates the notion of freedom, if we will be honest with it, don't you think? Uh, I, I'm, I don't see why that follows. I mean, I mean, I mean, it seems to me that... I, 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 that, let, that let, I, I can see, I can put just one more little touch. Hmm. Uh, the world is a certain way, uh, I'll augment the features uh, intentionally to kind of, to make the argument more visible. So there is a world, material world, which, in which we do have certain degree of freedom of defining the, the, the objects and structure, but on the other hand, it imposes itself on us mm -hmm. undeniably, right? Mm -hmm. so, so then um, if uh, we are, uh, sorry, I'll <laughs> so down the road. Yeah, but then the, basically that the imposition of the world is so strong, but it takes away my claim to freedom. I, I mean, it's 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 limited by the way the world imposes itself on on me by its crude materiality, by 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 the limits of my own biological survivability, you know, by the way uh, the life world is structured uh, around that grossly material influence. Uh, so, so then why the freedom of reduction? What are the limits of it? But, That's but, what but, I mean by determinism, yeah. Right, but I think there's two things going on here, right? I mean, I think that the, 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 the freedom of reduction is, is a freedom to precisely step out of that dialectic. Um, How far? The, the, that's always a question, right? And well, he wants to say, right, yeah, that, that you know, that, that there can never be a final reduction and so on. But like, but but it but it's a, but it's it, it's a it's a step to another level, which I think is the crucial thing, right? I mean, it, it's it's the level of uh, what he calls shawin, you know, of kind of uh, um, viewing uh, the, this intentional dialectic um, from 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 a place beyond it, from a place be above it, um, that. And and that and and that's a different degree. That's a different realm of freedom than the freedom that that occurs within the intentional relation. It seems to me it's a meta freedom. It's a it's a. Oh, it's I see a, what you mean. Okay, yeah. yeah. Don't yeah. you think it's just a consolation? It's just a consolation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but, but what? To, but but to me, it's the first. It's the step that allows us to get going at all in phenomenology. I mean, because yeah. if we couldn't make that step, then we would simply be in the natural attitude. We would simply be in that interplay of intentionality, you know? That's true. Yeah, but yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I got to I gotta have a question. So um, I still um, am unhappy um, or not um, clear about what the hyletic is. Um, because something that Olga said made me think that, you know, it's the older is. It's like the pure givenness or something, or something that is, um, but the hyletic, so let me just ask this question. So is the hyletic intended to be still a human hyletic? Whatever that is, it's something that we get to play with. We get to massage, we get to get into the tape. We draw it into this dialogue with the noetic and the oema and all these things. Um, but, but the hyletic is something which is somehow given in some pure sense, but is it just a human givenness, hyletic? And then the other question I have is this transhumanism. So um, once we get into transhumanism, does that mean the hyletic possibly changes? Um, I don't know. So I just don't quite get the hyletic. I know we have to start somewhere, and that maybe is the isness that, that we can't get beyond whatever it is. But I, I'm I'm not satisfied with the highlighting is. Sally. Yeah. Well, I just want to say that um, I'm kind of conflicted too about the term because uh, going back to what I was saying, you know, an hour ago, uh, you're if you're looking at a tree at night, well, you know that that's not what the tree looks like, but that doesn't diminish the rea the 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 real, the reality of that experience. 
I think um, I'll say one thing, and then maybe if you would permit me, I, I really like this discussion, but I do have to leave to pick up our daughters at round two. Maybe I could stay a little bit longer. So if it would be okay, I'd like to say something in response to to Olga and Bill and Sally, and then continue. Is that is that all right? Although before I do that, uh, David, Muhammad, Karen, or Asha, do you have anything? Because you haven't said anything. I just want to make sure. Okay, so um, just on this last point, Olga brought up the word dialectic, and I don't really know what that means. I mean, I've read Marx, I've read Hegel, I've read Plato, I've read Husserl. I, I have some notion about what it means, but it really stumps me ultimately. Um, so I, I do think, though, that if he says it's an absolute sphere of formless stuffs, right, what he's saying is, there is a baseline to whatever we're going to call dialectics. There's a baseline to the, the noetic noematic relationship. And that baseline in consciousness is unformed uh, fields of data that we, you know, have to figure out how we experience that as a, as, as Gordon was talking about. A, a brown surface. So setting a limit to dialectics or setting an origin point, I think is, is an important thing to do. And um, the action that my subjectivity does, animating construal, is likewise not something I'm, I'm able to catch myself doing. It's happening before I even get to whether or not I turn my head to see the tree. Or you know whether the sound irritates me before I, I, I act, actively listen to it. So I think what this means is that, and it's not going to answer your question, Bill, about human or transhumanism, but um, I cannot get behind this initial relationship between formless stuffs and animating form-bringing activity. That's that's what I'm that that's the limit of what phenomenology can talk about. And so I, I, it, otherwise we wouldn't have intentionality to begin with. I think the other thing I've tried to say is that it's precisely this togetherness in a pre-intentional way that makes possible intentionality in this dialectical relationship that Felix and Olga were talking about. Um, and and as far as Felix, I think everything you said, I think I would agree with in terms of the freedom. I hadn't thought about it those ways. I do remember two things. Um, Olga, I took your question to be, do we ever get out of intentionality? Are we ever not with an object? And I think that even someone like Meister Eckhart, who would talk about withdrawal in order to leave behind, like we're not out of an intentional relationship with the ground or with God or whatever. It's just that, in other words, we cannot exchange perception for some other modal thing, some other structural thing. We, we can't exchange intuition, intentionality for something else. But what we can do is shift our perceptions. And the, the way we know we can do that is by this global freedom to, as Felix said, sort of go to a meta level of freedom. And I think this bears fruit psychologically. Um, you know, I, I had a friend who recently told me that he felt inadequate with other people and he felt um, caught between people. And I said, look, you really need to do some work on your perception because you're neither inadequate nor caught, but you, your whole situation reinforces this perception for you. You, I can't just say you're not caught or you're not inadequate because it, it's it, you're gonna you're not gonna see that in your relationships around you, um, and so we do have to have a certain kind of ability to suspend perception and to suspend what seems obvious in the natural attitude is what we take for granted as being real, being certain in order to have a different perception, but those different perceptions are not our our will. They are by means of doing real work and opening up new relationships and new experiences that may yield to us a different kind of call. And so that sort of psychological work, that sort of work on our, on our real personal lives, I think 
is possible only if we agree that the kind of global freedom or absolute freedom that Felix is talking about, I think Husserl is talking about, is in fact real. Um, because otherwise there's no there's no hope. We're just caught, as Felix, I think, said. Like we're we're not we're not alive to the allure of um the the other people, the things, the alternative possibilities. But we we're not free to stop having intentionality. We're just free to move from one side of an object or one side of a relationship to another, and then retrospectively to be able to cancel out the previous and inadequate and provisional, one of the words Felix used was provisional, the provisional way in which we had associated ourselves with this particular situation, this particular relationship. Um, but anyway, I, I really like this conversation though, and I do think it gets back to something that um, uh, Fink used to say about the, the reduction, that namely, I think he said that there is no, um, there's no historical event that can cause the possibility to do the reduction. And that's a question that I've always struggled with because I think that Husserl says something different in the crisis of the European sciences. I think it's the very crisis that he sees in the sciences, particularly with respect to nuclear war, that can motivate us to take on this absolute freedom as a, as a way of restructuring um, what we think is obvious. Anyway, how about transhumanism? Uh, Bill brought that up. Can we? That, does that mean how animals see the world? I'm not. I'm not actually. It's dialectics is, and transhumanism are like things that I don't understand. What What did you mean, Bill? You're muted. It's meant that by transhumanism we become non-human, I guess, and so if we become non-human. Then the hyaluronic might change, et cetera, and then who knows what can change. Oh, okay. Well, my way of my way of thinking that is, you know, a sound to a dog, fireworks, right? And a sound to me, fireworks, um, is very, very different. And so the hyletic data for the dog is terrifying. And right, and the hyletic data yields something else for me. Um anyway. All right. Um, I, I feel a little awkward breaking up conversation. I feel like this has been our most fruitful conversation at a, at a break in the, in the paper. And so I apologize for going on. And it really is just my schedule that, that has that necessity. Um, Asha, yes, I see your hand. Yeah, thanks, Pistra. I was uh, listening to that uh, question from Olga and your response also. I mean, it makes me wonder, I mean, uh, the way you explained, uh, I, I, of course, I, I mean, like to go with it. Uh, however, my worry is this. I mean, uh, if I understand uh, your interpretation correctly, then there is no possibility of what Olga called, uh, I mean, taking from Indian philosophy, a kind of pure consciousness without any uh, international reference to an object. Uh, that's what uh, I understood from your explanation, if I uh, understood you correctly. But then my question is, uh, going back to Kant, uh, you know, this famous saying, I can think of, uh, of, of space empty of objects, uh, but not, uh, you know, objects without space. Is that empty space uh, devoid of any uh, intentional noema of Kant? I, I'm just trying to capture that one yeah thank you that that's um that's a really good question let me just try a basic response that may be very wrong and and then uh, olga and felix and gordon and everybody else can can correct me and and give you a better answer i think that um we don't have to have an intentional relationship with an actual object. Like it is possible for Husserl to focus on intentional lived experiences as the object that we're talking about. That is, we can we can reflect imminently on our lived experience. We can reflect imminently on our lived experience, say, of the transcendental ego, like Bill said. And in that sense, we don't have a tree or a book or a dog as, as our object of experience but we still have a, a noetic noematic correlation. Um, and I guess where I would go to, where I would point you is in ideas one where he talks about 
you know, if there's an annihilation of the world that doesn't touch consciousness. And I think that that means that the in structure of intentionality does not actually depend on uh, something other than me providing the transcendence that would generate the, the correlation. But I'll leave that to other people if, if people want to. Thanks, thanks. That's a very right wonderful uh, starting point. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. That was a great question. And I'm happy you asked it. I don't know how to answer your question about Kant, so I'm just going to like pretend that I can't answer, or to pretend that that I'm that I've forgotten it because it's it's a little bit like I don't know how to say it. But I'll I'll work on that. I'll 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 have something for next time. Um, one thirteen, as Husserl finishes up this chapter four, he's going to build off of his discussion of neutralized positing by taking stock of the relation of doxic modalities to each other in the noetic sense. In section 13, he notes 265 at the bottom, quote, the consciousness of time originaliter itself functions as perceptual consciousness. This is an important recognition because it continues the discussion of quasi-positing. I perceive time, but not as an object in the usual sense. This may actually be an answer to your question. As Sustral says, the consciousness of time, quote, is obviously not a continual perceiving of something imminent in the pregnant sense. I do not perceive my perception of time as an object, and what I perceive as time is a difficult question, as Asha just said. However, the uniqueness of time consciousness does serve to set out the parameters by which something is generally perceived, that object or noema appears as, quote, personally present, leibhaftige gegenwart, to the ego. And the ego, quote, attentively perceives the appearing physical thing, seizing upon, positing it as actually existing, end quote. The relation between the personal or fleshly, Leibhaftige, appearance of the thing, and the positing of existence is fairly clear. What is new in section 113, however, is the parallel between the background of the object perceived in relation to that object and the background of the doxic positing in relation to the doxic position currently being held. Each perception, Husserl says on page 267, has its background. This background is co-appearing, mit erscheinende. This means that there is a root, R-O-U-T-E, many roots from what is being actually perceived to what can be perceived in relation to it. There is a noetic parallel. Quote, this is 267 at the bottom. The same thing happens with the modal variations of the specific doxic positing. I can move from straightforward certainty and straightforward perceiving to deeming likely, deeming possible, and questioning. This is because doxic positionality has its own background, its own set of embedded, non-actional, for the moment, links to other possibilities of position taking. Thus, both in the noetic and noematic realms, there is a blueprint of movement. Quote, this is 268, grounded in the essence of the phenomenological situation, is the ideal possibility of actualizing the potential positings included in that. The motivation to do this is what Husserl does not talk about here, but which is implied in the fact that the potential positings are pre-given within the whole nexus. Well, now 114. In section 114, Husserl now talks about the background of doxic positions, ab about how those the background reveals that consciousness is radically distinguished from itself by means of an actual or quasi-position taking, an actual doxic position, or the neutrality modification. He says this explicitly on page 269 in the middle. Quote, consciousness is traversed by a radical separation. This distinction or separation regards whether or not there is an actual act of consciousness, a cogito, that intends its object within the modes of existence it can posit, or whether there is a quasi-act of consciousness, which Husserl calls a counterpart. This is 269 in the middle. Quote, to every cogito there belongs a counterpart, which precisely corresponds to it, such that its noema has its precisely corresponding counter noema in the parallel cogito. The neutrality modification then marks itself out as against the usual way of intending. It is a gegenstück or a shadowing, a schatten, or an improper, un case, not actually positing cogito. 
Such a description is a bit surprising, but it shows that what Husserl wants to emphasize here is that the neutrality modification is, quote, not of the same essence, 269 bottom, as perception. What are we involved with in neutrality modification? And how is it that it gives us this radical separation in consciousness between what we're actionally doing and what we're non actionally doing? We are involved with a virtual reality in which a, quote, powerless reflection, craft losa spiegelum, of actual positing allows us to build into the layers of the world by means of deferring the power of doxic position taking. I defer Durer's engraving as such in order to posit the realities that the engraving and the lines on the parchment give me over to. So I think um, Gordon's point about aesthetics is really important. And it, this is just like a few different sketches that Husserl is doing on the, the role of the image, which has been collected into a volume translated in English of fantasy and image consciousness, which are all really interesting. And they just sort of continue this work in Ideas One. Um, the shadow positions, this is 271 in the middle, Schatten Zetzelman, that I can take up in order to do these kinds of chains of significations are still pre-designated. They are not nothing, but are given right in the situation as part of the possibility of doxic positings. Consciousness is thus, quote, a double type, prototype and shadow, Erbild und Schatten. I believe that this duality in consciousness, and again, we're talking about the neutrality modification versus a kind of straightforward perception, this duality in consciousness, this powerless participation in noematic recognition, begs to be considered in relation to the abschattungen that serve as the spread or field of unnoticed hyletic variations or profiles, which themselves, as a continuously organized system of differences, support the unitary perception of a quality or a characteristic. It cannot be only that Husserl has noticed, quote, a universal difference pertaining to consciousness, page 70, 272, but that this difference is fundamental to the combinatory possibilities of acts of consciousness with each other. Quote, there emerge really remarkable and profound eidetic combinations among act, act characteristics of believing and all other kinds of act characteristics. So what we're trying to figure out is why, you know, in, in a sense of Olga's question about, you know, why do we have this absolute freedom? Why and how does this power of neutrality modification and all the kinds of possibilities that it opens up, how does it work with respect to what is not a neutrality modification and why are they together? Like, what does that mean for us? Section 115, describing the distinction within consciousness between straightforward doxic position takings within noetic acts and on the other side, neutralized position takings, allows Husserl further in section 115 to talk about the distinction between, quote, affected acts and non-affected acts, 273 at the bottom. I saw the engraving by Durer before I was carried into religious or morbid reveries, night, death, and the devil. That earlier act of intending, quote, nonetheless, always has an existence pertaining to the lived experience, Erlebnis Dasein. It's 273 in the middle. Thus, the distinction in consciousness does not prevent combinations. Rather, embedded within neutrality modification is the power of the original act of perceiving the engraving and its doxic position. Furthermore, the neutrality modification is not some handy tool inserted by Husserl, a distinction in order to discover more. That would be like what, you know, the uh, Anglo philosophical tradition would do, insert a distinction to see what would happen. He's not inserting a distinction, he's, he's discovering. Rather, he says, quote, acts in the widest sense bear within themselves the distinction between positionality and neutrality. Bear within themselves is in sich tragen. The noetic acts, according to their distinction, quote, are productive noematically and positionally prior to the transmutation into cogitationes. This is 274. This means that before I have turned toward the devil in Dura's engraving, my frightened perception of it has already surveyed the territory and stood there ready to replace the perception of the engraving and the figures within the perception of the meaning of the devil in relation to the night. Positings are not separate from the noetic acts, but characters within them, 
quote, the positings or the positings in the mode of quasi, like some, are already actually present in them, the noamata, with the whole noesis to which these positings belong. There is not first a noema, and then a noesis, and then an experience. The noema has already had the noesis in a pregnant sense within the appropriate level. And the doxic position that would allow the noesis to intend the noema in that actional or non-actional, actual or neutral way, is already there as well in that noesis that is itself in the noema. Nothing comes from the outside since the noema is imminent within consciousness. The only thing that takes time, as it were, is my attention to travel along the ray of regard in order to allow the previous interlocking of doxic position, noesis and noema, to take flame, to catch fire. As Husserl says at the top of page 275, quote, any positing act characteristic whatever includes in its essence, in Zeke Birgt, a characteristic of the genus doxic positing coinciding with it, Zik Dekenden, in a certain manner. So any positing act characteristic includes in itself a characteristic of, of a doxic positing. Each intentional act is made to be doxic. It is from within doxic. And particular belief doxic modalities coincide or overlay any other structure of a noesis. There are no parts of noetic acts that are not participating in the unity and center of that act. The reason that neutrality modification can also be at the heart of a noetic act is that the neutrality modification is always, quote, related back to the primal positing. It's relation back again. 116. In section 116, Husserl simply argues that the doxic modalities at the heart of the noesis show up mirrored as, quote, new noematic moments in the correlates. This is 277 top. This kind of claim is difficult to show, but Husserl lays this out as a task for phenomenology to describe and to locate. He takes up the example of an experience of value. The noetic act of valuing roots itself in the valued as valued, but this valued as valued functions, quote, in a way similar to the possible, presumable, etc., although it would be absurd to put them in this series of characteristics, end quote. What I take it he means here is that the noema shows itself differently within the doxic positions that take it up. It is our task to notice how the actually valued appears differently from the possibly valued, etc. 117. As Husserl moves on to talk about the ways in which doxic modalities or doxic positings are within the noesis, and as a full noesis within the corresponding noema, he notes that the neutrality modification, the quasi-positing, is not preeminent. Experience is organized around the, quote, preeminence of the primal positing, or doxa, because the certainty of perception, to be blunt, has its deepest foundation in the things themselves. This is 280 at the bottom. The things we perceive tell us what is preeminent in our own acts and in the doxic positions we take. The things show us that perceptual certainty is the core around which all other position takings and act characteristics and sense of noemata appear. One of the main reasons that things tell us that the primal doxa is the center of experience is that objects are directly perceived or intuited only within an intending that is doxic. Quote, the doxic cogito alone affects actual objectivation. Page 282 at the bottom. The doxic positings, this is again a quote, single out objectivities of a unique content. And, you know, the last two things I've just said really rehabilitate the power of the noetic, the freedom of the noetic. And it's very easy to make the move there to say, okay, well, this is just cognitive. This is just our doing that allows the noema to show itself. Um, I think you have to take it in the mirroring and the parallelism and, and notice, notice that he's moving back from the noematic intentionality talk to what the noetic does. Um, so the doxic positings, as I said before, single out objectivities of a unique content. That's 282 in the middle. 
Constitution is thus more like sensitivity. And so I guess, although this is where I would agree, that a theory of perception is embedded in phenomenology. As if constitution is sensitivity, it is the possibility of entering into a new world of intertwined noematic senses. Valuing consciousness allows valuing to appear from within a doxic position. I might value philosophy if I studied it. I value philosophy because I study it. And then, depending on what I say, philosophy as a valuable thing can open up to me. A neutrality modification of value would be neither valuing nor non-valuing, neither seeing nor being blinded. I might be as blind to philosophy as I am to Durer's actual engraving. 118, most of my students are, are in fact uh, in the neutrality modification, I, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> Experiences of mine, in section 118, combine in one experiential life. Acts of consciousness also combine with one another and have as their correlate noema. I perceive this paper as I type. I type it, I think about it, I pause and consider it, I return to typing. All of these are supported by their inherent capacity to be united around one object. This is because all of my acts of consciousness and all of their objects are together essentially. This is on 283 at the bottom. Quote, no matter how alien, fremda, in essence, lived experiences can be with respect to one another, they are nonetheless constituted together as one temporal stream, as members in one phenomenological time. My time consciousness, my temporality, my life, this is what brings what is alien together. Even more so, this is what stamps each of my experiences with echoes of the other and allows me to have my own style, if you will, as I leap from writing the paper to cooking dinner to listening to our children. I, you know, you want to talk about how what a constancy of the object, the constancy of the subject is just as much a, a problem. Right? As our children can tell you that I don't cook dinner as well as I may write a philosophy paper, or I don't talk, listen to them the way I would listen to Husserl. Right? I just need to ask them, they'll tell you. It is this inherent, ongoing, absolute self-unification that I depend upon in order to unify the acts that actually do take up the same noematic object. The section 119. From the assertion of time consciousness as the unity of all unities, Husserl moves to the way I can unite or transform polythetical acts to antithetical acts. I can collect multiple trees into a forest by seeing them, chapters into a book, children into a family or a loving gaze, students into a class, colleagues into a webinar. And this means that I can convert my doxic positing of each of you and your comments and questions into a single and simple doxic positing. My act of collecting, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm the boss, right? I'm just saying my experience of you is, is kind of a boss. My act of collecting empowers my doxic position taking to be about more than one thing at once and to be about a collection as a single whole. In section 120, one thing that Husserl notes is that doxic position takings do not always presuppose one another. It is not that a collectivity or an essence requires that I have already had a doxic position on each member or variation. Like I can see the forest before I see the trees. In terms of an essence, Husserl argues two things. First, the experience of an essence involves taking a doxic position and is not a neutralized act. And second, the seeing of an essence does not necessarily involve taking a doxic position on all the variations which make the seeing of it possible. The intuition of an essence is a perception, and as such, it takes a stand on the appearance of the essence that it seizes upon. The seeing of an essence is not a suspension of doxic positions in favor of some phantom that I cannot decide whether to posit. Like if I see this as a table, I have to have seen table in order to do that. But when I reflect on my seeing of tableness, it is I'm not unclear as to the status of tableness, right? It's not, I'm not unclear as to the status of the essence of the table. I do not forget or suspend the individuals or the variations that allowed the essence to show itself. The essence table is within the particular tables that I now see as tables. 
But it is also true that the seeing of the essence does not require my taking a doxic position on all variations. There may be variations I do not remember or did not actually perceive, but the seeing of the essence renders that meaningless. An essential intuition is the actual sensitivity to the essence in every variation now and retroactively. In section 121, Lissrell talks about the example, quote, of the mother who looks lovingly upon her flock of children and who embraces each child singly and all together in one act of love. This is 289 at the top. This is like the third really cool example in this section. Uh, this act of collecting preserves both the perceptual and moral relationship to each child, as well as to the whole family. So notice we started with the, the mirroring and the parallelism between noetic and noematic. And Husserl has said you have to describe on one hand the noetic, on the other hand the noematic, and on the third, their, their correlations. And I've said this is like having a relationship. You look at the individual and the other individual and the relationship as such. This is what's happening here in the collectivity. Um, loving is the same act in the individuals and in the flock. Or as Husserl says, this is amazing. I love this short sentence, top of page 289. Loving is itself collective. I know he's just making a, a logical point, but I think it's a really cool point. The act is by its nature or its essence capable of multi-ray doxic position takings and capable of uniting multiple objects within one object. Loving is not apart from, quote, the objectivating and perhaps the plural judging underlying it. This is again at the top of 289. Loving is rather thoroughly enmeshed with the act of collecting the children as one group, as one's own. This is at the bottom of 289. Quote, the flock of children loved is, as love object, a collectivum. That signifies not only a material collectivum, and in addition a love, but a love collectivum. So it's not like we went, oh, there's five of you. Oh, you're all in my own family. Oh, I love each one of you. Oh, I love all of you. Like if you had to wait, <laughs> that the love is never going to get going. You don't have to wait. Loving is immediately collective. It doesn't like piggyback on some other thing. The collective logical act is within the loving act. So the layers of the noetic interpenetrate one another. To lo loving is accorded the power of collecting and of judging. They are the same act in the act of loving. Thus, the noetic embeds itself into its own higher levels the way that the noematic core embeds itself into its higher levels. This is 122. Synthetic life and consciousness is possible, Husserl says in section 122, because the multiple rays of regard, the having together of different objects or experiences, relate to the ego as to their, quote, primal source of generations. If the primal doxa is what neutrality modification um, relates back to, if perception is what other modes of intending relate back to, it seems clear here that the ego is what syntheses relate back to. The ego and its spontaneity, in other words, is what allows, quote, a creative beginning for each act. That's 291 at the bottom. It is the ego that holds together its own acts in its internal temporality and thus allows for collection to show itself as a possibility that enables love of the mother of multiple children or of seeing holes as holes, W-H-O-L-E-S. But the ego is supported in all of this by the noema, quote, and this is 292 in the middle, the mode of givenness of the meant as meant changes in the variation of positing or in the steps of the synthesis. And one can show these changes in the particular noematic content and make them salient in it as a stratum proper. The task of phenomenology then is to show how the ego and the noema support one another. On the side of the mother's noema, the identical flock of children as her own. On the side of the mother, the act of loving as itself collective, or, quote, the whole form of articulation according to positing and synthesizing. The noetic mode of actionality, attention, doxic position, and form of articulation correspond to modes of givenness and characteristics in the noema and to an identical sense. In the neutrality modification, however, the ego will, quote, withdraw, zuruch zihen, 
and release at last the positional correlate from its grip. I no longer see the Durer engraving and my consciousness toward it as engraving is withdrawn. But in releasing that intending, I still maintain it as I am still in some sense in front of it. But what is now not in grip allows me to advert to another theme, perhaps the coming of my own death as the night. Um, this notion of a release shows up here, and it's something that Heidegger and other people will do a lot with. This, this possibility of release is also, I think, what um, might give us the, the freedom of play that Olga was, I think, implying in her question about uh, Eastern practice, and what I think I was trying to talk about with respect to my friend who was having some difficulty. 124. As Husserl ends the chapter, he turns again to what faithful expression of the relationship of noesis and noema might mean. Now he embeds the notion of expression within logical signification. It is not just the act of speaking or writing or even thinking. The holding together of the object within a form of articulation is itself expression. This is 295 in the middle. Quote, expression is a distinctive form which allows for adapting to every sense the noematic core, and raises it to the realm of logos, of the conceptual, and on that account, the universal. Expression is adaptive. It is an attempt to conceptualize what the relationship is between act and object in consciousness. As such, expression is a noetic act that all other noetic acts need to conform to so that the noema can appear as having the expression corresponding to its relation to the noetic, quote, conceptually stamped. Begrifflik Ausbrat. It's 295 at the bottom. The expression as an internal characteristic. It is not to brand the noema as if it were a cow. It is not to force the stamp upon it, but rather it is to allow the noema to show that it really is already stamped with the thing we are now saying. What expression thus embodies for Husserl is, quote, the coincidence, Declan, between expression and noema noesis correlation. The expression takes the same doxic position as the noetic layer it expresses. It reveals the same noema as the noetic allows in the clearing. Faithful description is, quote, not something like a coat of varnish or like a piece of clothing. This is 297. But description is also new. It is powerful. This goes back to the provisional character that Felix was talking about. The reason we have to describe and make explicit is that there are always going to be new meanings that we can recognize that we have already begun to use in order to see the previous side that we thought was the most important. And so description, quote, is always exercising new intentive functions on the intentive substratum. This is 297 while still being, this is in Husserl's words, subjected to the intentive functions of the substratum. So I've been trying, as Bill had noted, I'm trying to really amp up the noema's agency. Here he says, subjected to the intentive functions of the substratum. Description and expression then is a kind of opening up of new territory by means of being true to the combinations that are opening for us in light of our experiences. I'm almost done, and then I, I apologize, I will have to leave, um, but I'll just say 125 is my last section. It can also be that we perceive or ex that what we perceive or experience adapts to how we express it. Quote, the substratum can be a confused unitary something, and often is, which does not actually include in itself its articulation but instead owes its articulation to mere adaptation, blossom on possum, to the stratum of the logical expression actually articulated and affected in its original or like the world changes by means of uh, our, our experience. The thing in other words can begin to resemble how we speak of it, but its mere adaptation is not nothing for its power remains intact and thus we have to continue to view description as provisional and testing out the experience. As Thich Nhat Hanh said, the raft is not the shore. Indeed, as Husserl admits in section 126, 
The very fact that expression attempts to render the noetic noematic correlation into universal terms means that it is never adequate or complete qua expression. This is at page 300 at the top. Quote, it is inherent in the sense of the universality belonging to the essence of expressing that all the particulars of the expressed can never be reflected in the expression. There will always be more to say. Um, I apologize for having to leave. I am really grateful to all of you for a wonderful opportunity to be with you and to, to think about these things. Um, I think what we'll do is take a break until February and then come back for ideas too. I will have, if it's, you know, if people want to change the format of the person, please let me know and it's fine. I don't, I don't mind, but I will continue. Uh, I think you've given me your okay before. What I'll do is suggest one, between one and five sections of the final part of ideas one to read over. Ideas two for February. I think Bill made a comment that, you know, this is all leading up to ideas two. I do think that you'll find that to be true. Um, and I, I'm very hopeful that we'll have uh, continued participation from all of you. Again, to all of you, I'm very, very grateful. This has really charged me, uh, energized me. So thank you. See you.